So tonight we're going to be talking about um, the opioid crisis going on in this country. And if you've read the papers at all, you know that uh, we have a very severe problem. Uh, so much so that the White House itself has created a task force to uh, address this issue and is making recommendations to the CDC. Uh, that's just happened in the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, you know, in 1999, uh, one of the academies that belonged to the American Academy of Pain Medicine um, wrote a white paper, innocently enough, saying, look, we've got all these people with pain, and we think that we should be able to treat them better. Uh, and we think that it's appropriate to be using uh, narcotic medications uh, for the benign pain syndromes, benign meaning non-cancerous. Prior to that, we would only use opioids either for short-term, for acute pain syndromes, or for uh, the uh, cancer pain where people were dying, and we knew they'd get addicted, and so be it. Uh, in 1999, that all changed with that white paper, and we began to look at opioid medications as an opportunity to help people who were suffering with chronic pain conditions for which we had no other answers. All the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and unfortunately, we created a monster. Uh, we now uh, struggle with about 17,000 deaths from overdose uh, from narcotics, most of which are uh, prescribed appropriately and most of which have been prescribed for pain problems. Uh, so it's an extremely serious problem. We also have a lot of side effects uh, that occur from the chronic use of opioid medications uh, and uh, those in themselves can create additional problems inclusive of worsening the pain situation that we're actually treating. So it's a very complex situation. It's not a yes-no answer. It's not that we should stop prescribing narcotic medications, but we have to be very thoughtful and careful about how we're doing it, and we need to reconsider uh, the safeguards we put in place to make sure that uh, people are not going to be damaged by these prescription uh, medications. So there's a time and a place for the opioids, but it really needs to be under much more controlled situations with people who are experienced with prescribing these medications. But there are other options, and that's what we're also going to be talking about tonight, because what has been missed in the process of all this is that there's been evolving research showing that integrative and alternative therapies, uh, such as acupuncture, uh, complementary therapies, can be highly effective at managing pain. So much so that in many cases they're more effective with, than the opioid medications, certainly with none of the side effects of the opioids, and many times with side effects are particularly beneficial. So tonight it's my privilege to introduce uh, Rebecca Berkson. Uh, Rebecca is an uh, acupuncturist, herbalist, practicing in our center. Uh, she's a graduate of, uh, with a master's in uh, acupuncture from Bastyr University, uh, and she also has a master's uh, from the uh, Georgetown uh, Integrative uh, Medicine Program uh, across the river. Uh, Rebecca is just an outstanding practitioner. Uh, she's brought a huge amount of depth and expertise to the center. We are absolutely uh, delighted uh, to have her working with us and uh, delighted that uh, she's giving this lecture tonight. I think there's a great deal that she can teach you about options, uh, not only for replacing opioid medications with potentially better pain relieving methods, but also for treating some of the side effects that can occur with opioids so that we can mitigate some of the problems uh, that the opioid medications may cause, even though they are creating enough benefit for you. So it's my privilege tonight to prevent Rebecca. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan, um, for that very nice introduction. Um, so this, this is a topic, acupuncture and the opioid crisis, I feel you know, very strongly about, very passionate. Um, you know, I work in the clinic every day with patients who have a lot of pain. Um, and you know, they're the fortunate ones, the ones that find this other solution um, you know, for, their, for their pain conditions. So the lecture tonight, um, I'm going to be going over you know, it, what exactly is this opioid epidemic, going over some of the statistics, um, and, and what's going on in the public health arena right now, which, you know, as Dr. Um, Kaplan mentioned, really changes on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and, and then what role acupuncture can play in this? Um, so it can reduce pain, reduce the need for painkillers. Um, we'll talk about a little bit about the me mechanism of action, um, the research, 
um, which is, by the way, media mediated by endorphins. Um, so our body's natural painkillers and opioids. Um, and then also um, talk a little bit about the treatment for addiction and dependence, which acupuncture can be helpful with. Um, I'll go over a, a case study and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, so if you could save those to the end, that would be great. Um, so what exactly are we talking about with this public health crisis? So an epidemic, um, according to the uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC refers to an increase, often sudden, in the number of cases of a disease above what is normally expected in that population in that area. So this is, this is something that the CDC uses in um, regards to this uh, opioid epidemic, which it truly is. Um, in 2013, among people between the ages of 25 and 64, um, drug overdose caused more deaths than motor vehicle accidents. And of those drug overdoses, uh, about 50% were related to prescription drugs, so those prescribed uh, by physicians. And, um, and the major two categories of drugs that we're talking about are uh, opioids, which are responsible for about 70% of these uh, deaths, and then 30% um, involving benzodiazepines. Um, so this talk is gonna be all focused on um, opioids, um, but a lot of what I'm talking about today can also be relevant for, for benzos. And, and in addition, the, the uh, deaths related to heroin um, all of which are increasing. The graph on the right there um, shows the total number of deaths from, from 2001 to 2014, as you can see, are, are on the rise. Um, and um, and the, the lines, the orange line is um, men and um, the yellow is, is women. So men uh, you know, are affected more, but the gap is definitely getting smaller. Um, and unfortunately, the very last block you can see there is 2014. This continues to be an accelerating issue. Uh, another big issue is, um, you know, it, it's just the, the vast amounts of medications that are out there. So the number of total prescriptions for opioids have escalated from 76 million in 1991 to nearly 207 million in 2013. Um, so the, the amount of uh, medications that we're talking about has quadrupled. Um, deaths have also quadrupled. And during this period, there has not been any corresponding increase of pain for Americans. Um, and we are talking about Americans here. The United States is the biggest consumer globally, accounting for 100% of the world total for hydrocodone or Vicodin, and 80, about 80% 80 for oxycodone or Percocet. So this is, you know, we're talking about 5% of the world's population that are, you know, consuming these drugs. Um, this uh, right here shows uh, the, the relationship between the sale of uh, opioids um, and, the, and the deaths from, from uh, overdoses. So uh, this, this is a, a study that just came out last month um, in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a review. Um, and, uh, and this talks about the, the relationship between um, non-medical prescription opioids and heroin use. So uh, one of the um, uh, issues is that a lot of the, um, the, the uh, drugs are not being used medically, um, although about uh, the majority of people who are using um, the drugs non-medically are getting them from friends and family who have been prescribed. Um, so uh, in 2014, 10.3 uh, million people reported using prescription opioids non-medically. Um, between 2010 and 2012, it seemed that the, the prescribing um, had started to stabilize. Um, and this is a lot of, you know, due to the efforts uh, of the regulatory boards. Uh, so there was a decrease in availability. The problem is that this, uh, uh, there, there's evidence to suggest that people who are using the opioids non-medically are shifting over to heroin use. Um, so it's a 145% increase in the heroin use from 2007 to 2014, um, and uh, five times more deaths from 2000 to 2014. Um, and so you can see these, these numbers are pretty um, staggering. Uh, this is, again, shows the relationship between the prescription opioids um, and deaths and, and heroin. 
So let's take a, a step back a, a little bit. Um, you can see what a, a huge problem this is. Um, but what exactly is an opioid? Um, and so can you tell me where are they naturally occurring, these, uh, these medications or uh, this, this substance? What's a natural form of an opioid? Poppy, Poppy seed, yes. And there's, there's one other. There's people. That is correct. <laughs> you got it. Um, so opium from poppy seeds, the, the latex is uh, about 12% morphine, and, um, and in, in humans and in animals, um, we have endogenous opioid peptides that act as neurotransmitters. So that's why these, these work in our bodies, is because we have the, um, you know, the, the receptors for them, because they're naturally occurring in our body. Uh, so opioids are uh, referred to as a substance that causes a morphine-like effect. Um, like I said, they're naturally occurring in the body as endorphins, enkephalins, and dynorphins. Um, they act on three major opioid receptors uh, called delta, kappa, and mu uh, receptors. And they're released in response to pain, exercise, orgasm, excitement. Um, morphine was first isolated in 1806, and it was introduced uh, in, in the United States by a German company in 1898 for, for medical use. This was heroin uh, was introduced. Um, and the pictures on the uh, right side, that's a, a morphine a molecule. Um, and then the, this schematic here is um, you know, the, the synapse between two nerve cells, so to, uh, two nerve cells talking to each other through uh, this, this, the green dots uh, would be the, um, uh, endorphins attaching to the uh, the receptors here. Um, so that's what's going on on a physiological basis. Uh, which What are the drugs that we're talking about here? This is, uh, it's a little bit small for you guys, but I think you have handouts. Um, these are the generic brain, uh, brands, generic and brand names for each of the, the major medications. Um, so codeine, uh, fentanyl, uh, hydrocodone, um, uh, morphine, uh, these are the, the, the common, uh, the generic names. And the, as, uh, as Dr. Kaplan mentioned, and you know, a full disclaimer, I'm not a physician, um, I did not go to medical school, I do not prescribe uh, medications. Um, th but uh, you know, these are all used for a variety of different ways. And if any of you, like myself, has, have ever shown up to the emergency room in a lot of pain, you know, I could appreciate these medications as something that provides a lot of fast-acting, you know, pain relief. Um, so it's not an issue of, you know, it's all bad or it's all good. Um, but the, the variations in these medications are long and short-acting. Some are synthetic, some are derived from morphine. There's uh, variations in the receptor selectivity, um, and, as a, uh, and because of that, also variations in side effects. Um, and they, there's a variety of, of administrations. Um, one thing that's important is um, this guy right here, naloxone, is the antagonist that will uh, bind the receptor. So this is what uh, reverses the effects. Uh, so this is really important in the treatment of, of overdose is naloxone. And it's also important for research purposes because it can uh, knock out um, the uh, endorphins, which we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, so effects of opioids, analgesia is that, that cr uh, either chronic or acute pain relief. Um, it reduces not only the intensity of pain, but also produces an indifference to pain. You know, I'm, I'm, I still feel the pain, but I don't really care, so I'm good. <laughs> um, this is mostly due to the mu receptors in the spinal cord, the thalamus, and the limbic system. Um, euphoria, this is where people get into trouble with uh, addiction because th there's a strong feeling of of contentment, a lack of concern. These are those feel-good um, uh, feelings. Um, and, uh, and this is likely due to both effects on emotions and also on the dopamine reinforcement pathway. Um, some other effects, uh, respiratory depression, this is the, the main reason, um, uh, the, the main cause of overdoses due to opioids is respiratory depression. Um, sedation, it causes drowsiness, uh, napping, but doesn't actually help with the quality of sleep. Um, it just causes the sedation. Um, the constriction of the pupils, this is how you can spot an addict. Um, constipation, 
Um, if for any of you that watched the Super Bowl, there was a, a an ad uh, for um, the for a medi for medications that are uh, addressing the side effects of opioids for constipation. They spent probably like ten million dollars on this thirty second ad. But if if nothing else, it shows you how prevalent this is. If they were willing to to do a Super Bowl ad for it, so this picture is from that ad. Um, and uh, cough suppression is another effect of, of morphine or opioids, um, and it's used in medications as codeine. Uh, so the, the, I just want to make sure that we understand the difference between physical dependence and, and addiction. So physical dependence is when the body relies on an external source for, for a medication. So in this case, the, uh, the opioids. Um, physical dependence, it, it is predictable, it's managed, and the way that, that we deal with this is by tapering people down from the medications very slowly. Um, addiction, on the, on the other hand, is a disease uh, in itself, and it's the hallmark symptom is cravings. So inability to control the, the use, um, even at, after uh, you know, harming oneself. And so the, the process of, uh, of recovery is quite different for, for dependence and addiction. Um, for addiction, you really have to do therapy and replace these addictive behaviors with uh, healthy alternative ones. So very, very different things that we're talking about here. So what's going on? Um, actually, Dr. Kaplan mentioned uh, about um, President Obama announced uh, earlier, um, a couple weeks ago, um, that uh, in his new budget, there was, there's $1.1 billion uh, for new funding to address this issue. It's $1.1 billion of new funding. This is on top of uh, past programs that he has, um, building upon the national drug control uh, strategy and the prescription drug abuse prevention plan. Um, so this involves a number of different um, agencies, including the Department of Justice, um, Health and Human Services, and also increased funding to states. It's, it's kind of a wide range of, um, of programs that this is really aimed at, um, but the majority of them are for prevention programs, for prescription drug monitoring programs, um, also medication-assisted treatments, um, an expansion at the at the state level for pretty much everything, um, including prevention tra uh, strategies, um, and also improved access to the the uh, drug naloxone. Um, access to treatment um, is uh, you know both for um, for prescription drug abuse and heroin, and also for treatment providers. and And there's money for doing research in the best way of of uh, dealing with this treatment wise. Um, and then from a, you know, the Department of Justice side, enforcement activities. Um, so the, the CDC also recently came out with new guidelines um, for, uh, for prescribing opioids. They haven't uh, um, published them yet, but they just came out um, in, in January. They offered a, a public comment period for them. And so we know what was in them from that public comment, which is a, a lot of uh, safe prescribing practices, um, you know, to limit uh, opioid use and, and addiction, um, and a number of state policies similar to um, in Obama's plan, um, and, and additional to the prescription prescription drug monitoring programs. So, you know, as you can see, there's a lot being done um, in order, you know, to uh, to treat the um, the addictions and also um, to make sure that people are, um, you know, prescribing them for for the right reasons. The problem is that you know w what's missing is um, is non pharmacological interventions. You know, what about the options of of treatments that have no drugs <laughs> associated with them at all? Um, and you know, and for the rest of the talk tonight, we're going to talk about one of them, which is acupuncture. Um, but uh, but this is you know what we do at the Kaplan Center is be able to 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 see each individual person and say, okay, what's how can we treat the root of the problem? You know, what do, we don't want to just mask it with painkillers, right? Um, and so that's what uh, we're aiming to do with acupuncture. Uh, the Joint Commission is one group that's. Uh, that's uh, gotten a hold of this. 
Um, they have, so the, the Joint Commission is the, uh, is the organization that does accreditation um, and certification for hospitals across the country. Um, and uh, they have revised their standards for chronic pain, which do, in, do include acupuncture as a non-pharmacological strategy. So this, this is really a big deal for us um, to, to get included in this. Um, this is gonna be rolled out with every hospital in the country.